Hello YouTube, I recently had the opportunity to sit down and chat with Logan Hillier about his work on Kingdom Come Deliverance 1 and 2, and while we will not discuss KCD2 story points in this interview, the nature of our discussion here means that this video does contain spoilers for the first game. So if you haven't played KCD1 all the way through, best to look away right now. Here is Logan capturing and beating up Sean Bean. It's not your concern. But we, of course, know him much better for capturing and beating up Henry of Scalitz as treacherous bad guy Istvan Toth. Well, I mean, it's been a long while since I had a romantic lead, you know? We had a long chat about his career path and several of his projects, as well as KCD, so I'll go turn on the lights and we can hear what he had to say. Don't go away. Welcome to Night's Arcade. I am Sleepless Night, and today I'm here with Logan Hillier, who uh, all of you KCD fans will know as Istvan Toth from Kingdom Come Deliverance, who will be returning in KCD 2. Welcome to the, the Arcade. Lord be Logan. praised. <laughs> Indeed. It's very good to have you with us. I suppose I should start by saying I'm sorry I called you a sword stealing asshole in my trailer breakdown, but. Uh, oh, God. It's do? okay. People have thrown a lot of, a lot of stuff at me. Oh, well. Um, over the last few weeks, it's, um, I'm ready. Bring it, bring it. You Excellent. Know? Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. On the flip side of that, you and Gags made me get Instagram as a result. So, like, I, I feel like we're even now. Yeah, that's its own form of evil. Definitely, Instagram. You know, right. there's different Absolutely. planes of I evil agree. that we get sucked into. <laughs> do you consider yourself an actor first and a VO second, or do you not see any distinction between the two? I don't know. I think probably well, my journey is quite very strange, like back into theatre or back into acting, as you say, um, because I guess probably like you, I um, I was a child actor. So, you know, I was um, in that kind of National Youth Theatre stuff and an acting school mm. when I was like 11 until 16. So I basically, you know, learned to be an actor when I was younger and um but uh, then I decided I wanted to go into science. So um, oh, right. I went into, yeah, yeah. Like I, my background's in biochem and genetics in terms of university. But um, but then, you know, I ended up, well, I did a little bit of science work after, you know, university for government and uh, hospitals and so on. But um, then I started teaching uh, science, science, actually. I was a science teacher in, um, in Colville in uh, the uk it was great i love it i love it so many great experiences there and um and then uh, i started teaching the drama club and then i kind of like and then when i moved to prague i was kind of like I'd be, taught myself to be a drama teacher as well as a science teacher and um so i started teaching drama in prague as well and uh and that led me into those you know expat actor circles with um probably yeah, yeah. a lot of the other actors that you've um, that you've talked to and um yeah and then you know one thing led to another and it, you're just getting roles in 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 films and so on because it's Prague so it's a it's a scene and you know um I guess the the advantage that we have out there is that you know there's not so much competition and yeah obviously no, oh I know that you, from yeah from I mean that's the thing experience, yeah. South Korea as well you know those actors out there the expat actors you know they're getting jobs that they wouldn't necessarily get in London right but but at the same time, you know, um, as a group of actors, we've we've gained loads of experience over the years. So yeah. we're a very experienced team. So, um, so yeah, we're an interesting, interesting bunch. Yeah, it, it it is it is a lot easier. I mean, I started, as I say, I got into voiceover by accident. I was living in uh, Sweden, mm -hmm. in Stockholm, and I was right. a tour, I was a tour guide there at the time. Uh, but as you can imagine, a lot of it was cruise ships. And as you can probably imagine, Stockholm does not get cruise ships in the winter. A lot right. of them can't even get into the harbour some mm -hmm. days because it's all yeah, frozen yeah. over. But um, so I signed up to an extras website. I thought oh, I haven't done any acting for a long time. I'm sure that, you know, just as something to help get me. And as you say, you know, as a native English speaker in Stockholm, voiceover work particularly is quite easy to come by when you're, yeah. uh, well, yeah at least a lot easier than it is now that I'm back in the UK. You know, when you're yeah, yeah. back in the UK, that's 
not quite as easy. They're everywhere, but in the yeah. in uh, in other countries. So yeah. Uh, so how did you initially get the job playing Istvan Top? What what? So I I mean you say you were living in Prague. So oh um, well, what the the role from yeah the role yeah. Uh, there was a series of like castings and so on, and um, I don't know. I, I don't know how much I should say about this, but like I think I was. Um, <laughs> I was either a good voice fit or a good face fit for one of uh, Dan's like bet noirs from his history, I think. <laughs> so he uh, channeled some of that that villain uh, from his past. But again, I don't want to go into any more detail about that. So uh, I think I resonated um, with with him. Uh, I guess I must have done. Um, with yeah, that. and then um, and then I played a bunch of other. Uh, little roles in it as well. I didn't really even realize uh, what the part was to begin with. This fan, in terms of the complexity and the yeah. and the depth and breadth of the role, you know, it's been really great to um, to play him, you know. But um, but yeah, I played a bunch of other characters as well in that in that first it's, one. So it's been so long since I actually play. As I say, I've become known for that game, but it's it's actually been a very long time. People ask me questions about it all the time. I said, I don't, I haven't actually played the game for years now really um because i tend to play a game to death and then move on yeah but, yeah, but, yeah and then stop no I, it was a great game it was a great game oh, like fantastic. i played it and you know there were some amazing scenes in there and um you know I'm, i i love the, the father godwin scene is insanely good it's so <laughs> funny i was just laughing my ass off when i played that for the yeah, first time that was a friend of mine actually uh scott williams he did Brilliant. It was so funny. And the other one that really sticks in my memory in terms of like, you know, comedy was um the one where you follow the witches into the woods and they all Oh my turned. god. Oh my god. That was I so not funny. About it's, that. If nobody if that's spo- <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but no, it's of course, very yeah. lewd, everyone. When yeah, you figure yeah. it out, it's very lewd. That is um, that is that is a trippy, <laughs> trippy scene. Man. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely- <laughs> And it was interesting how they put that magic element in there with drugs and, you know, hallucinations and so on. Yeah. And so they, they incorporated it all really well while sticking to the, you know, no magic theme. But that's what's it's great like, about it, actually, because there's no magic, you know, you start yeah, absolutely. focusing on the natural threats. Yeah. And um, and there are many, right, in the game. So Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah there, I, think, I think it's because I think... As I say, as a result of my channel developing the way it has, people expect me to play medieval games and fancy games, which is not really my thing. It's not really yeah. my favorite genre, but I but I really, really, what appealed to me about KCD is all the marketing they did beforehand, particularly about um, how great the combat would be and how much they were concentrating on the realism of the combat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I must admit, anybody that's watched my series of walkthroughs <laughs> from back in 2018 knows you can tell just by watching them that for the first three or four hours i hated that game I just oh hated. yeah 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 it, it but, resists you doesn't it it may yeah. but I, but in the end that's why you get into it you know and that's what that's the that's the the nature of any great um rpg i think that you know you feel the pain at the beginning you feel what it's like to be level one and then well, you know I mean, you really appreciate it when you're level 50. I was, I think, um, I was first really drawn in by the handscape on hunting scene, um, and then I was just, I, I was hooked from there on. Out. Yeah, that was, was some, good. that was good. But so again, much having acting. to follow him, having to follow him on the horse, all of those kind of tasks really built the character extremely yeah, well. Absolutely, and um, yeah, I was, I was, I was really happy to play it, and I was lucky, I think, because I had a decent computer at the time, so I didn't really have any problems per se. But um, but learning the combat. Is one of the best parts about it because you're actually you're not just like oh I know this because it's the same as every game. Yeah, you Back actually have to learn. Them. You have yeah. to learn. So, oh. um, so yeah, it was really rewarding, and you're learning all the history as well at the same time. So, well, so, so one of the things that really drew me in, as well as the, over time, of course, the combat got me hooked in the first place. But over time, the story and how the characters developed and and the acting, I just was so much better than a lot of the stuff that was about at the time. And I have to say, mm-hmm. and this is nothing to do with me interviewing you now, one of right. my, f- I have, I don't know, perhaps because I'm a VO, I don't know, but I have, I I kind of latch on to certain lines from TV shows and movies and they stay with me for weeks and weeks. 
And whenever I tell people what they are, they give me funny looks like, why that line? That's so obscure. I don't know. I just like the way it was delivered. And for me, one of my favorites is uh, Vrani Camp, when when Hen when it becomes clear to Henry, spoiler alert for anyone who's not played KCD, you might want to skip the next twenty seconds or so. When it became when it becomes clear to Henry that oh that you're there, that Ishvan Toth is there, there's this back and forth exchange between the two of you about the sword, and I loved it. And there's one line that for some reason it just lives in my head rent free, which is why you say to him, and I suspect he's looking for this, and it's the sword, yeah. and you say, "Am I right, young man?" And I expect he's looking for this. Am I right, young man? You bastard. And it's, I don't know why, but the way that line is delivered, yeah. just, it lives red free in my head. I thought <laughs> it, it was it, it just says, so well um, When he says, uh, you know what, I think I'll keep it. That's like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and being in the Czech Republic for a long time as well. I can really appreciate the Czech humor in that ending. Yeah. It's like really, really dark Czech humor. And it's like you go through all of that effort, you go through all of that work, and it's like, ha ha, next time. So, um, yeah, it was really because I mean, I guess when you're playing the game for the first time, you figure that you're going to get the sword about halfway through or something. You know? Yeah, of gonna, course. Yeah. And then you're going to enjoy using it. But, um, but no, it's a symbol, and it's and it and it's uh and it's great how they're doing that. I mean, I can talk about my you know kind of literary take on it, but I think it's brilliantly written, um and 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 because it's so that's part of why it's so immersive. You know, it's brilliantly written, mm. and you really feel like you're you really feel like you're there. Um, yeah, I I think I think the struggle, as you said before, I think the struggle to. <clears throat> The struggle that you have to go through in the early parts of the game really, really drags you into it and you become invested in a way. Um, this is what's impressing me about video games these days and why I'm so interested in it. But it fascinates me how the difference between how invested you become in the TV or movie character that you're watching and and video games, it's much more like much more like reading a, a, a novel or a series of novels. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, become so novel, much yeah. more invested yeah. in the characters. Um, and I think you definitely gave off... I, I remember the the scene where you first meet Henry and, and Radzig and they're there with Martin, and you were definitely giving off bad guy vibes there. What say you say, Sven? True, Sir Radzig. If I'd have had its like back in Nicopolis, things would have worked out differently. How... Odd to find such an accomplished swordsmith working in a place like this. Very definitely, I thought, oh, this is, I don't like this Radiating guy. background evil. Because, <laughs> I, now, I don't think there will be many people watching this um, mm -hmm. who are not already KCD fans, but for those who might not be too familiar with it, um, there there is... I guess if you played KCD but have played it a while ago and maybe forgotten about it, of course you I regard Ishvan Toth as it's like a it's like it's almost like a Darth Vader Emperor situation for Star Wars fans. It's like there's a Ishvan Toth I think of as the the real evil bad guy in the background there. He's like 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 people talk about Mark Vart von Aulich, but he seems less like a soldier doing his job to me. Yeah, I think he's more like Istvan's more like Littlefinger, right? From um, from Game, Game of Thrones, Thrones you know. Yeah. He's the, he's more of a rogue than he is a warrior. Yeah. Uh, but he's just a very high level rogue. Um, is the way I saw him. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't, <laughs> in terms of his 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 swordsmanship, I guess that's down to the to the designers, you know, and whatever goes into how good I am at the at the sword. But um, yeah, but the moves he makes, you know, he is more of a he's more of a rogue. And, and you, um, yeah, do you enjoy playing villains? I mean, I know this is this is the classic question for actors, but do you? But from when I've had to do it, in my, I like. I mean, I I love it, and I know what my reasons are. But I'm just curious to know what your reasons are. If if that's something that you enjoy doing, I know a lot of actors do. Well, I mean, it's been a long while since I had a romantic lead, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, but when I was growing up, I did I did those kind of like romantic kind of. Uh, hero yeah. kind of parts and I guess I mean you know like they're always a bit they don't have the edge do they that villains have no and 
you know, it comes down into the, like why why is evil beautiful? You know, why did why did Lucifer fall and all of that kind of thing? I mean, you know, evil is attractive. So yeah, I mean, it's finding finding the tragedy of why the character is evil rather yes. than playing them just purely as a devil, yeah, yeah. which is two dimensional, right? And and I think you you certainly get to know Istvan pretty well, you know, um, in many ways. And yeah. you're beginning, I think, you're beginning to detect where that, where the origin of evil is, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's probably one of the more interesting things for me as an actor about the the sequel, because obviously, you know, Istvan's in it. You can tell that from the trailer. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, you do learn more about... Uh, about his character and, 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 and so on. So um and there's a that. there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. As I said, I mean all of the characters are very well written, but I really enjoyed discovering those uh those levels for myself, you know, as well when I was working on it. And also yeah. um afterwards thinking about it, I'm like, oh I see what they've done there. You know, I see I see what the writer's That's done there. The director, you know, the directing is is the action, it's in the moments and so on. But then yeah. you step back at it, you look at it as a as a piece of writing and you go, Oh, I see, you know, it's um... well, a lot, a lot of it is in, particularly if it's a video game or a TV show or a movie, I think a lot of it is in, a lot of it is in the back. I think a lot of playing a villain or, or writing a villain or writing any character really is in the things that you don't tell the audience explicitly. Um, and I think, I think, who am I thinking of now? Ian, I think Ian McDermott, when he was when he was invited back to the Star Wars prequels, I think I seem to remember him saying something like, "He said, well, it's as you just said, it's the the nuance, really. It's the because I think what he said was even if you think about it, even Lucifer fell. So mm. no one is, you know, he's the personification of evil on most people's minds, but even he fell. You know, nobody starts off that way, or you know, the majority yeah, of people yeah, yeah, don't start yeah. off that way." It's it's like you know like any um, any bad character has got to has got to have something that's driving them to do yeah, what they're doing, especially if they're doing more evil, and um, and I think that's what makes them fascinating because they're they're kind of puzzles, aren't they? They're they're they're, they're yeah. riddles that you have to kind of unlock. They're mysterious and powerful and often intelligent, and um, and so they're always generating this kind of like um attractiveness but i mean i don't i you know i don't know about whether i would select villains you know like if i could pick my you know favorite roles to role, play yeah. whether i would pick yeah. it's always the it's always the bad guy yeah. um because i think it, you know especially as i get older as well and like you know and i i, I reach uh, you know i count different parts in theater and in, in, in various areas you know i'm playing kind of older characters it's kind of like, well, yeah, you go through that evil, you know, like everyone has to battle, everyone has to go to war, you know, Every, at some point in your life, you have to go to war, you have to fight for something that you believe in. And those experiences often, you, you often do things that you don't necessarily want to have done, you know, or like, or regret, you know, and they, and they shape you. So those, those bad experiences you have and those bad things that you do, you know, if you can turn them into wisdom, I think that's where the journey from villain to to Gandalf is, you know, well, <laughs> and, think, uh, and that's I the think, kind of journey that I'm uh, trying to make. Yeah, I think I think as as actors, I think I think all actors enjoy, you know, what they really want is a character with depth, and there's, yeah, you know, as we yeah. all do, and and of course you get to explore a lot of that uh, if it's written well. You get to explore a lot of that uh, in villains, particularly because you know everybody wants to know what drives them and what what's motivating them. What so but, is. Here's a weird question that somebody yeah, asked on, yeah. me to ask. It was actually my wife that suggested I ask this, and I thought that's why she wanted to know. Oh, she sweet. said, "What?" So while making KCD, she says, "Do the bad? Is there a thing? Is there a sort of vibe? Do the bad guys and the good guys do you hang out, or is this unspoken kind of wall between?" <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I think you know, like a lot of people, you know, they do a lot of projecting you know, onto me and that's, that's okay. You know, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, if, look, if I'm, if I'm kind of like, um, ostracized, you know, yep. then it kind of means that I've done a great job as an actor. Oh right? yeah. Because, Absolutely. you know, I'm being ostracized because they do actually genuinely dislike me because yes. I'm a fan top, so.
you know, oh, yeah. but um, right. but yeah, I hope they've got, I hope they've got, you know, a soft spot somewhere in their hearts for me and and think about me occasionally. You know? I l- I love the character when they're having honestly. a drink together without me. Honestly, as I said, as I said, I don't know why. I but... think they're just there are lines that are delivered in such a way, as I said before, that they just live rent. You know, I mean, there are obvious ones. You know, if you look at like Jake. Uh, I was watching a thing recently about James Spader mm. and um, some popular. Oh, it was um, the Avengers um, when he was in uh, Age of Ultron, I think, and he did this. You know, his whole gravelly that was tangled in strings, kind of. You know that kind of, which it's just amazing. Is there a voice? I know you consider it, so. It'd been more acting as a broad scope, but when it in terms of voice, is there a voice? that you can think of that you envy or that you wish you had or that like oh wow that that really blows you away when when you hear just the quality of their voice as well as how they deliver their lines that's a good question i think it Mm -hmm. might you know what i'm going to go with a a very actorly answer um but i think it might be richard burton i think it was from um that War of the Worlds, you know, what? Jeff Wayne. Yeah, Jeff War Wayne. The... Jeff Wayne's I mean, War. my God, man, you know, and like I learned that, that that voice, like no one would have believed mm. in the late Excellent. part of the 19th century. But human affairs. I mean, like, oh, it's great. I, I love that. That is and I think well, honestly... did he play did he play O'Brien in 1984 as well, if I remember rightly. Oh, yes, he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 He did. He was unbelievable at that because it's a that i'm not like i wasn't a huge fan of that adaptation because obviously you prefer the book and yeah. so on but then looking at it critically as an actor you're like ah oh, damn that's good man because it what a role to yeah, do that that's... speech you know like the party the party stamping on the face of humanity forever and he's got and he's got the whole gravity of the party and the responsibility of the party that drives is, him into this fascist kind of... It is so long since I've seen that adaptation. I, it's, it was I, in it, I taught the monologue um, for a few years, you know, because I get yeah, into yeah. a monologue and I like teaching it, and then you explore the monologue in, in different ways. But but that monologue, yeah, it's like, oh, man, it's brutal. Oh, I did. I mean, I did yeah. a lot of that going through college, but but it was mainly with, mainly with Shakespeare because most of what I was studying was, you know... English language, it's, it's English like that, literature. Though. It's and, like that. I mean, my background's yeah. in Shakespeare. They like to well. hammer Macbeth to death in, yeah. at every opportunity for your teaching. It's like the number of times it comes up. I know. I have a lot of sympathy. I tried not to do that in my own teaching precisely yeah. because it's, you know, it's so done. You know, it's so done. And you you think about if you're a student and you're going to, uh, you're going to a, an interview or an audition or something and you're bringing another Ophelia and you're bringing another Juliet and so on. It's like, oh, come on. You've got to get clever, I think, these days to like stand out a little bit. So, I mean, if Shakespeare is the rule, which it often is in these auditions, then you have to like, you have to figure out a way of doing something interesting with it. So what, um, what are you involved with at the moment? If you can tell us, what are you, what are you, because you're in Greece. Um, you? I've got a yeah. play. Um, I've got a play in that I've written with a, a friend of mine. Um, who's a he's a um, I think he's a doctor of comparative literature from Yale. So he's very 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 qualified. And I I I had this um, it was a chapter from a Moorcock um, book. I don't know if you know Moorcock, Michael no, Moorcock at all. Really. Like high fantasy, like proper high mental. Yeah. No, no, not, fantasy, not familiar. You know? Not familiar with the name, Moorcock. Right? And um, oh, it's a crazy, it's a crazy play about uh, people playing with uh, like computer games and there, but the actual, they, they needed this game to be, be so powerful that it required the power source to drive the game. And the game is called the game of time. And then the power source to drive it kind of broke reality. And so the players are kind of all around this vortex and they're kind of, watching reality kind of splinter and they're trying to reshape it and stuff but it's uh it's uh he's done an amazing job with it i'm really looking forward to producing that and i play i play a character who goes through different transformations but i'm playing but one of the character one of the uh people that he becomes is is shakespeare which is why i've kind of let my hair do this kind of shakespearean <laughs> thing <laughs> um, so i'm gonna but then, but then, what happens in the play? Because I know many of your viewers won't get to see it, but hopefully, I can share some um, some video. But um, because they're they're kind of being pulled through these dimensional rifts, they're getting fused into different things. So 
So Shakespeare kind of fuses with Kafka at one point and becomes right. like Kafka. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's theatre. You know what theatre's like. It's theatre. Um, and then I'm uh, also with a company in Prague called Sadi Ten. Uh, Sadi right. Ten's a bad low. Um, and they're a great bunch. And they've got a play going to Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh right. Fringe, called Burnout. So if you're there, go and go and check out Burnout. That's uh, that's my company. I won't be there, but I'll be with them in spirit. And um, uh, but then I think we're going to be doing something in Prague as well um, uh, in in the fall. And uh, and then maybe Little Shop. Maybe oh, really? maybe Little Shop. Okay. I know. I know. That seems, a, that seems to have had a comeback lately, really. I've yeah, seen, I know. I think everyone's ready for a little, little shop revival. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I'm going to play the plant. I'm no, no, nice. Crossed. So, um, so yeah. So theatre, theatre, pretty much, and then. Um, but I'm also in Stalker too. The um, oh right, the yeah, computer yeah. game. Yeah, I've got a part in that. So, but I don't want to give any information about that. I don't know what the, you know, like what they. Have revealed what they haven't, mm -hmm. so I won't say anything further. But I'm, but I'm in that. Um, right. So you can come and find me there in Stalker Two. Uh, do you, so is there a particular person or actors that inspired you to become an actor? Or it, I know you said it kind of happened organically over time. It was something you did when you were younger and then came back to. But it was who were your favourites? Damn it, that's a great question. I don't know. Like I get okay. So the, the the teenage kind of boy question is like all the good fellas, you know. So that's right. it. Okay. Al Pacino, Rob De Niro, you know, Ray Liotta. I really like Ray Liotta. Yeah, yeah. And actually, my favorite Ray Liotta thing is in um, Revolver, uh, yeah. which is a Guy Ritchie film, which is really underrated because it's quite experimental. But um, but he's great in that. Um, so actually, Ray, yeah, Ray Liotta might be towards the top. Of my favorites, yeah. uh, John Malkovich, just because he, for me, he's kind of transcended the triangle of the art. You know, like he's become both himself and everyone yeah. and no one at the of same course. time. Yeah. And he delivers, and like in terms of his delivery, well, he did that of literally, novels, of course, didn't he? In, in being yeah, exactly. John yeah, in being John Malkovich, that was the portal, right, that he went yeah. through, and then he just, yeah, he's transcended. He's transcended the art, I think, and so I, I respect him a lot. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman is uh, oh, was yeah. great, oh, you know, yeah. the late Sadly. Philip Seymour. But um, yeah, yeah, excellent actor. I don't know, you know, I've got a lot of time for, and, and especially I don't really know names, but um, uh, but especially on Netflix has allowed you to see like yes, Central European absolutely. actors, like German especially, um, and Danish, and um, and I think they're great. And I I honestly think you know, like, I mean. I'm not saying this as a as a kind of like warning shot or anything, but uh, you know I think that a lot of British acting has got a little bit samey and a little bit, and it's great for the American market. Can be coated England, like oh, did you? But I, you know, yeah, and they yeah, and, yeah. and these acting schools kind of manuf manufacture these types, but you know I think it's a bit cookie cutter, and then you get to like I don't know, I don't know if you've watched Dark on the Netflix show, but that's German acting. But yet, there's no. just solid acting in there, just clever acting. And they don't need to eat a sandwich every minute to make it look realistic. You know, no. they're, just, <laughs> yeah. they're just like burying the acting. We've got um, this gimmick, let's so, never use it yet. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and I, again, I don't really know names to hand of, of, of those actors, but I no, think so Britain needs to watch out, you know, like because I think, you know, we Absolutely. are getting a bit lazy yeah. personally. And I don't we, say that to be mean. I just honestly think. We're actually just watching. Um, I know it's a years old now, but. I think, oh, anyway, let's, let's, I'm oh, not going right, right, right. to go off on another tangent because I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. We'll, we'll right. Okay, fans. so but back to KCD. Back to KCD. Yeah, so Ray Liotta, and, I think was the quick you. answer. Ray Liotta. Ray Liotta <laughs> is the quick answer. <laughs> right. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> ah, right. So, uh, regarding KCD uh, two, how has how has the experience of making this one been different than the first one? Because I know that uh, Luke was talking to me about how 
you know, you had the the whole face get up this time with the cameras. I mean, some of them did. I don't know if you did, but they had the oh, whole, yeah, yeah, the yeah, whole did, rig yeah, for the yeah. for the mocap. Uh, whereas before, I think in the previous game, it was you know the old tennis balls on. That was uh, like being a cyborg, to be honest. Balls on, yeah, yeah. Right. So, you so how, how little... it, in what other ways has it been sort of different from the first, if any? Um. It's a good question, but I think, like, for me, like, I was pretty... Okay, so the way I see it, right, and other actors may see it differently to me, but mm. the way I see it is, is it's very close to studio theatre in terms of the the acting that you have yep. to do. Yes, you have to do the pretend CGI thing for, you know, like, the kind of Hollywood, you know, acting stuff that isn't there and all of that, but... With the people that you're with, you're right there with them, and the and the the the, the camera is super close up. So it's more like studio studio theater in terms of the acting between people. So um, I already felt pretty good about acting in that way the first time, yeah. and I really enjoyed it. Um, and it was great with everyone, obviously, acting with Tom and, you know, a bunch of the other actors as well. It's fantastic working with all of them and the director of the first one was great as well uh, and, the you know, the, the director of the second one is also fantastic so the team was excellent um, but to, to me it's still it was still like a studio theatre thing so I felt like I was was, was was sharp to it and then what happened is I went through, uh, before we did some of the stuff, which I think you'll see in the game, actually, but uh, in terms of the the, the, the acting that, that I'm kind of producing, um, I'd done a lot of, like, really intense plays that were really intimate studio theatre. So it was a boutique right, yeah, yeah. play with this uh, Sadi 10 Divadlo company in Prague. And um, it was Death and the Maiden. I don't know if you know that play, but it's really No, funny. I don't know. Not familiar. It's like, a, a, it's horrible. It's, you know, based Pinochet, you know, a horror. Okay. Um, yeah, I, and I was I was a villain again. Yeah. And uh, a really, really terrible villain. You are, you know, in the same kind of level of the, as this fan, similar. Yeah. yeah, in fact, that was, that's true. It was very, it was very similar to this fan in some ways, because he was a bit of a rogue and he's, he's, he's pretending to be someone that he isn't, you know? Yeah. And, um, and I'd done that and the director had like beaten the, beating the crap out of me for like six weeks it was really methody and she dragged me across like the marble floor and like you know like I was bruised and battered and tortured and um <clears throat> by the by the experience but uh you know she got what she wanted from 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 putting me through the uh through the method like that but what was what was great about it, the, 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 you know, like I love the play and the play was fantastic, but the audiences were only like 15 people and it was yeah. in an apartment. So it was kind of like uh, aesthetic was kind of dark Ikea. You know, we're in this <laughs> Ikea apartment, everything's super Ikea, but there's a horror going to happen here. And and so you're, you're in the kind of Ikea dining room, you're in the, you're in the kind of Ikea space with these monsters. And... Um, and because of that, I'd, I'd again got loads of experience with the with the close up acting. So 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 when I went into doing KCD two, I I felt like I was like kind of like had got a, an idea of what I, I came back to it with vigor. You know what I mean? I came back to it going, yes, let's do this. Um, and so it was a lot of joy to come back to the character. Of course, like you know, like that was the most amazing thing about it to get to revisit it, uh, a role that I love so much um and deep in it so i don't think i think i th uh, honestly i think i'm going to echo a lot of other people here but if, if you liked kcd1 you're going to really like kcd2 and if you like the the story and the acting in kcd1 then again i think we've all grown up you know what i mean we've all been through stuff uh we've all been through you through life the last few years like everybody else you know so when they say that um KCD is darker, you know, and, and Henry's more of a more of a kind of arch chat, you know. It, it's true, like it's it's uh it's darker, it's grittier, and I and I think it's shaped by by these last few years personally, and I think that's I think How? that's good, you know. I think it's good that we've grounded that. 
So, I mean, do you, <clears throat> I mean, as I mean, I'm 50 now. <clears throat> so as um, I've been a gamer, well, since it was a thing, really, of video games, since they were a thing, really, right back at the beginning. Uh, and I, you know, having watched motion capture grow up, if you like, how, what are your opinions on how that's led? Because my, one of my favorite performances of the last 10 years or so in video gaming, I think, has got to be, for me, I mean, and this is just the sort of games that I play. You know, I don't really play a lot of really super gritty, really dark games. I do play a lot of RPGs. And mm -hmm. for me, Roger Clark's performance in, in Red Dead Redemption 2 was... Yeah, I didn't play it. I didn't play it. It was just that. stellar. But I, but yeah. the capture, it wasn't just everything about it seemed really sort of fluid and natural, and uh, you know the whole thing, every little motion that he made, you know, lighting matches on the soles of his, like every everything about it just seemed so fluid, and and how expressive actors can be now with these mocap rigs and stuff like that is, you know, oh, yeah. what is, yeah, 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 what yeah. is your and, feeling and, on how that's changed? And again, I think changed? you're going to see that in the, you'll see a lot of yeah. that in the making of documentary. And I know when we were making it, that those, the guys, obviously there's a whole team there working on that at the same time as you're, as you're doing the, you know, the game. So, um, and they were really excited. Some of the, some of the footage that they've got, <laughs> you know, really. And I think that's going to be, I think that's going to actually be really beautiful. I'm really excited to see that. I mean, just, I don't, you know, I know it's not going to have the, the mass appeal of the game, you know, but like for definitely for everybody involved, it's an amazing uh, celebration of, uh, of everybody's work. So it, I'm really looking forward to that. Because it's I funny as well watching us like muck around in the, you know, like in the leotards and we've got the polystyrene <laughs> swords. So we're jumping around in like a, you know, a matrix type thing. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's yeah you can't you can't be too uh you can't you can't be too vain about that kind of performance i guess no 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 no, no. i look awful i'm sure <laughs> absolutely awful <laughs> but, but I've got... i think we all do and everybody gets super sweaty as well you know we're all it's we're all I, I just by the end of the day i think and I, course, I just want to say know... as well actually like just maybe this is a, a good time to say it but you know i've worked with different uh crews over over time you know different types yeah. of people and the, the Warhorse Studios, we worked like we were working there, you know. Um, those actors when they when they were clocking on, they those they were worked. And uh we, you know, in a lot of in a lot of you know things you do as an actor, you get treated and you 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 get treated like a you know, oh you do you want this and do you want that and blah blah blah, and then you go on and say you one line and you know, it's not really a you know, it, it's no offense to anyone again, but I don't think it's as challenging as doing something like studio theater or doing yeah. something like this. And um and and we worked, you know, if you were doing like six hours of motion capture, you were doing six hours of work and the and it was great because it was it was like theater. It was that reward that you get from theater, that yeah. adrenaline and excitement and being in the character. So it was like gym, you know, it really felt like like theater gym. Um, and, and yeah, again, I hadn't got the hours that that Tom got, so like you know, he's he's going to have been absolutely exhausted by it. I'm sure, you know, what like worn out day in. How day much? Out. How much sort of time would you estimate? I mean, do you know, or do, how much? How many hours would you estimate you put into this? Do you think? I don't know. Like, well, I mean, excluding any time that I did, you know, character work and that kind of thing. Um, uh, hours in the hours at, at work at. The, the place. Work, yeah yeah i don't mean i don't mean in the game i'm talking about <laughs> for the first one i mean just for just for isfan or for all of the other characters like hours and hours and hours just just like, for isfan i think yeah for isfan um i did like in total maybe 40 48 something like that yeah. so like not not n n nothing like the you know the scope of what uh, Tom and Luke and people like that, Tom, to do, you know, like all the, all the all these other guys, you know, like loads of hours. But um, yeah, no, it's um, yeah, I think it was around that. And then there's voiceovers afterwards. You know, you've ADR, got yeah. hours in the air yeah, and, and this kind of thing. So that kind of adds up. You know, we've created a world where if you're going to do a medieval thing, 
then they didn't have American accents in a medieval time. So it's kind of, immer- it breaks the immersion. But for some reason, <laughs> it's okay to do posh Britain in the 13th century, oh, even though everybody me. sounded like they were from Leicester or something. For some don't reason, get me it's started okay on go, that. I've yeah, had this argument tonight, so many blah, times. Blah, blah. <laughs> Because I had commenters on the first game. I made a very popular review of the first game, and people kept coming in saying, why has this person got an American accent? Why has Father Godwin got an American accent? Why has is, why is Hanush, of course, why has he occasionally got an Australian accent it, that leaks through? And I said, why are they all speaking English at all? What? It's just, yeah, yeah, you know, exactly, just exactly, get over exactly. it. It's you, just... This is the problem. We're talking about it's early 15th century... Bohemia, for goodness sake. I know, but it, it, they have to, if they're going to sell realism, right, if that's the main part of the product, then they have to consider this, even though, as we both agreed there, it's not necessarily actually an issue of realism. <laughs> um, it's more an issue of what's commercially acceptable reality or history. Um, it's like in, it's like, I don't know if you ever watched Monkey Dust. Do you ever watch Monkey Dust? No, no. no. It was a BBC Three thing. It was a very dark cartoon, but they had like... Um, uh, They'd always have like American versions of the film. So they had an American version of Anne Frank and and right. and Anne Frank was Irish and was living okay. upstairs with her Irish family. Okay. And um, Hitler, <laughs> Hitler was English oh, and lived in course, Berlin, yeah, England. Right, obviously. <laughs> of course, of course he is, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you look, if you're going to have a bad guy, he's got to have a posh British accent, right? That's just the that's de facto evil. Of course. Right. I've got some questions from my viewers now. And I said, I, now, okay, you'll, yeah, forgive no me, you'll forgive me, you'll forgive me, because as I said, I didn't ask them, to be fair to them, I didn't ask them this question till really late, early on this evening. So I just, I didn't have time to write these questions out. I just copied and pasted. So it might Yeah, be yeah, it's all good. It's all good. No, no so stress. Eldar, Eldar says... Uh, Logan <clears throat> follows cats I, and takes pictures of them or mm-hmm. films them mm-hmm. on Instagram. I was not familiar right. with this. Eldar has yeah, brought this yeah, to yeah. my attention, but I can't recall <laughs> what their names are. Could you ask him if he's going to continue the series of their escapades? Uh, yeah. I, okay. So, uh, okay. This is a massive question. So, thank you, Eldar. I don't know <laughs> if I can answer it completely because uh, Kitten Beach, which is what you're talking about. Um, Kitten Beach is is not really, you know, um, it's not so much a place as an idea, you know, and it's a, and it's a, and it's a philosophy. So you know, think of Kitten Beach as a as a kind of ideal that we all that we all seek after. And importantly for medieval fans, uh, of which I'm sure everyone listening is, um, Kitten Beach, which is the story of me living with a bunch of feral cats um, in Greece. Um, is actually about kind of learning virtues, right? It's about learning, like almost like a medieval philosophy, like learning, learning what it means to be virtuous, learning what it means to be chivalric. And these cats kind of characterized these virtues that that I was so certainly, you know, seeking to learn and find within myself. And so the the six the six kind of virtues that I that I kind of focused in on that were named after the cats um, were were kind of, again, I don't want to sound too twee here, but right. times are dark, you know, and um, and it's good to it's good to seek after virtue, like honestly, everybody listening. Um, so the the virtues were, I think, bravery, um, adaptability, uh, perseverance, prudence, tenacity and loyalty so that was that's where that's the kind of philosophy behind kitten beach so will i continue those escapades you will have to if you want to learn more about kitten beach or 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 learn more about my kind of meta kind of storytelling then you should follow me on instagram that's kind of where i am that's kind of where i've ended up I don't know why I keep looking to my yeah, microphone so it's, for the camera. Yeah, like, if you want to learn about Kitten Beach, which I, again, like, it's a great question. I honestly think you should learn about Kitten Beach. I think it's a, I think it's a dream um, and an idea <laughs> worth worth fighting for. Um, but yeah, I follow me on Instagram. That's where you're going to get updates from me at the moment. And I don't know about other social media in the future. We'll we will see about uh, well, that. 
Thank you. I will put a link. I'll put a link to that in the description. Yeah, I'll, cool. I'll, All right, dig, it, I'll dig it out Thanks. and I'll put a link so people. Kitten Beach that. forever. <laughs> Kitten Beach. I've got you. T-shirts coming to you. Kitten Beach forever. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Carry on. Uh, but Aldo actually just wanted me to say he's a big fan uh, and he thinks that you're funny and that his part in The Fault, the little I have seen, he says. Uh, excuse me, let me just remove that. Well, that's nice. He watched The that's Fault. Okay, that's hilarious. Good. And he wants to know if there is a way to watch the whole play remotely, even if it requires pain. Yeah, so um, that's great. That's great. Thank you for thank you for mentioning that. Um, the Fault mm -hmm. is, a, is a play um, that will be in Prague, probably in the winter. And um, you've already told I've already told you a little bit about my character as like kind of a fusion of Kafka and Shakespeare. And there's an interdimensional rose. It all gets very silly, uh, but it's very well written and very, very epic. And there's a lot of great lines in there. So certainly there will be there will be pieces of the fault um, put in various forms, whether it be Instagram or um, or YouTube or, or any of these other platforms, because, again, the fault as I see it, isn't so much a piece of theatre as is an idea um, that probably has come um, come of time, you know, come of its age. Yeah, uh, needs to be needs to be thought about. It's kind of implications of science gone mad. I think that's yeah. the that's the kind of essence of it. Like no regulation. Again, I don't want to stop everybody's fun, but I think <laughs> it's probably time to regulate everything heavily. Right? Yes. If that's my political stance that's your, that's everyone your take away from it, who's right? been having way too much fun with science and with finance and all of that stuff everybody needs to be regulated okay end of my political run no worries no yeah. we haven't got a lot that's of time in the, left. that's kind of folded into the into the play as well and okay. there'll be and there'll be um there'll be uh yeah various fragments of it but if you want to come and see it then it will be in prague um and I will I will give you the location and the date uh, closer to the time. But okay, what what the um, what you saw was uh, a piece from a reading, a staged reading that we did. It wasn't a performance. It was kind of a gathering of people and, and students and so on that interested in literature and theatre yeah. and that kind of thing and underground kind of that kind of thing. It was out myself. It was great. It was good fun. <laughs> And as I said, the writer is fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to doing that when I go back. Excellent. Uh, well, GW asks, are you a gamer? Which you told me that you are. And have you played yeah. Kingdom Come Deliverance? He wants to know. Yes, yes. I have. Ne I nearly completed it. Basically, it was a good game. It didn't glitch um, until right at the monastery. And when I got into oh. the monastery crime scene, there was a weird little jump. And um, the um, the perpetrator kind of revealed his identity straight away, and that kind of like mangled the monastery mission. And then I couldn't right. I couldn't unscrew it for some reason. And um, and then I think there's some there was another game competing for my time, but I did a lot of the game. I spent I don't know many many hours going through the woods and fighting Hungarians and <laughs> tracking myself down and, and, and so on. So, um, yeah, um, I have, I am a player. Yes, I am. A, I am a gamer. He's a gamer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Aku asked a similar question to uh, what I asked earlier on. Um, how has this role, Istvan, presumably he's talking about, been different from previous roles and ha what have been the biggest challenges? Yeah, so I don't I don't see it as necessarily being evil, but uh, sorry, I don't see it as necessarily being significantly different from roles I've played in the past. I have played similar roles, but the fusion and then the direction obviously made it completely different. And then the way in which we were, you know, recording this kind of material, the studio setting, the all of the equipment that you're wearing, all of these, you know, you you have to do these weird kind of T poses where you're kind of <laughs> right, becoming yeah. like a Tron, like a yeah. Tron figure. Yeah. And yeah, it's a very strange ritual that's kind of behind it. So learning all of that, and it kind of goes into it, you know, like I don't think the the guys will necessarily be thinking about it like that. I don't know. But like that's the way I, you know, because you have these things where you put makeup on, right, in, a, in the yeah. theatre. You, you do various rituals. Well, these ones are different because you've got this weird kind of like magnetic kind of field that you're in. So, um, 
and and that that was interesting the way that 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 process of uh, I don't know, I don't want to sound too pretentious here and I'm, that's really <laughs> not my intention but you kind of like you kind of become you prepare right the act the actor yeah, prepares of course of course you know and there's a different there was a different journey for that and I and it shapes it it shapes it because you're actually acting differently when you're in a leotard like a very embarrassing leotard you kind of got to go for it. You yeah, know, of course. You look yeah. stupid. You look really stupid. The but so does everybody else, do. I guess. If you, if you... Yeah, but you've just got to, that, that just like makes you commit, you know, it makes you commit in a in a, in a way that's different, I think, to theatre. Because I think sometimes in theatre, especially if the costume designer is good, then you can hide behind your costume a bit. If of the course, costume yeah. is great, yeah, it's like, absolutely. look at the costume, oh crap, just look at the costume. <laughs> Whereas uh, you basically like, you know, you're kind of like, um, you're very exposed. Yeah, it's very, it's quite vulnerable kind of acting. It's it's, it's interesting. Excellent. Um, but yeah, I think that was probably the biggest challenge, like bouncing around in 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 this kind of like meta space and uh, and getting used to all of that. And the, the, the thing, um, uh, this headset that goes on your back, there's like oh, yeah, a kind yeah. of like massive, like I don't know whether it's a power pack or a memory pack or something like that, but that's almost like a cybernetic implant. Like it, it kind of digs into your, it digs into the, your cerebellum. And um, that was painful, you know? And again, a good director would tell you to use that, you know? Yeah. A good director would say, okay, well then use it. So, you know, like then we're just using it. You're using the pain, you're using the exposure, you're using all of that stuff. And it's helping you make a character that's like sharper, I think. So, so yes, there were challenges, but we used them. Yeah. Excellent answer. Thank you very much for that, Logan. We're mm. just about out of time here. And I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. It. Sorry, man. Sorry. No, no, don't worry about yeah. that. It's like the more we get out of you, the better. That's been great. Yeah. No, I tend to ramble, though. Yeah. But, oh, well, I do the same. So it wasn't a good <laughs> combination, really. So you get me rambling. I'm sure the viewers won't see a lot of the rambling that you and I did between. Okay, yeah, please bits. cut anything that's too embarrassing and, and definitely cut the bits where I said that everybody was an idiot, you know? <laughs> that interview had rather an abrupt end when Zoom kicked me off because I don't have the wherewithal to purchase the version that doesn't kick you off every 40 minutes, so apologies for that. But you can find links to Logan's Instagram in the video description if you'd like to keep up with his current and upcoming projects. He's quite active on there and always has a lot going on, so head over and check it out if you're into doing the Instagram thing. I tend to edit these interviews and discussions down to a manageable size for YouTube, trying to keep in only the most relevant bits, since I do have a tendency to ramble when in a discussion, and previous experience has shown me that YouTube viewers as a whole tend to like a more compact, more concise video, and not as many viewers come to watch the longer extended versions. But if you're one of my Patreon patrons, I will be putting up a less heavily edited version on there in the next couple of days, which keeps in most of the 10 minutes long tangents on completely unconnected topics. Aren't you lucky? That's it from me, but there will be more KCD content from me in the coming weeks and months. But in the meantime, if there's something you especially want to ask me, you can leave a comment or follow me on Twitter, Facebook and even Instagram now or you can join my lovely community in the Sleepless Night Discord server. All of these things are linked in the video description or in the links section at the top of the Knights Arcade channel page. But until next time, from Knights Arcade, this is Sleepless Night, saying nighty-night.